treated so bad Then I sit and think about I can't miss a friend that I never had Oh, Lord, oh, Lord. I need you to hold my hand I can't make it by myself Oh, Lord, oh, Lord. I need you to hold my hand One more thing, church Continue to run with Jesus Even if I have to run alone Because it's my determination To make God beautiful Ever my own Oh, Lord, oh, Lord I need you to hold my hand Right now, right now, right now, right now Oh, Lord, oh, Lord I need you to hold my hand Sometime when girls press me, I say, hold me, hold me, Jesus, Jesus, hold me, hold me, please, Jesus, Jesus, the reason why, hold me, I want you to hold me, Jesus, Lord. if you don't hold me, hold me, I will surely fall, Jesus, I need your strength, hold me, I need your mercy, Lord. Jesus, if you hold me, hold me, everything will be all right, Jesus, somebody need you, hold Lord. Jesus, somebody need you, hold Lord. Be a lawyer, Jesus. Somebody lying, hold me on the bed of affliction. Jesus, they have pain, hold me. They have so much pain, Jesus. So much hold pain me. in their bodies, Jesus. They said, no, hold me, hold me right now, Lord. Jesus, Lord, I need hold you me. right now, Lord. Jesus, you are not to hold me. Yes, you are, Jesus. Jesus. Somebody say you're a lawyer. Hold me. Yes, you are, Jesus. Jesus. Somebody say you pray. Hold me. Pray when I'm home. Jesus. Somebody say you want to. Hold me. You want to win a person. Jesus. Somebody say you're a rock. Hold me. Somebody say you're a rock. Jesus. Somebody say you're a rock. Hold me. A rock in a weary land. Jesus. Others say you're a shelter. Hold me. In the time of a storm. Jesus. I want to take a little time out. And ask you one question right now. Jesus, do you need the Lord? Hold me. Do you need the Lord? Jesus, do you need Him to hold? Hold me. Hold you in the morning. Jesus, hold you in the evening. Hold me. Hold you later, 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 Hold me. When you call on Jesus, Jesus, and mean it from your heart, church. Hold me. Won't He answer prayer? Jesus, won't He answer prayer? Hold me. Good morning, Lomax family. Today is June the 14th, 2020, and we thank you for joining us in this worship experience. Today is Children's Day, and we're excited to have a meditation as a part of our worship experience today that will be brought to you by Reverend Tina Nelson. We also have a video that we want to show you of our children engaging in their Children's Day activities virtually. Our class tonight is to celebrate Children's Day, and our children stay typically at Lomax or at uh, Church in Middle Atlantic District. Our, our this, uh, conference is the second Sunday in June. Um, I'm going to start off with a couple of scriptures. Our scripture first is shout out loud, do not hold back. Lift your voice like a trumpet. And that's from Isaiah, the 58th chapter in the first verse. Who's Isaiah? Isaiah is a book in the Bible, one of the chapters in the Bible. Did you know that I read my Bible? Yes. So you're going to listen right now, though, okay? So children, today what we're going to learn about mostly is voting and voting rights and your right to vote and the fact that you are the future of this country and you are the future of um, our black society and voting is your right and we want you to value the right to vote. We're going to start with the scripture which is from Exodus, the 18th chapter, 21st verse. It says, but select 
from all the people, some capable, honest men who fear God and hate bribes, appoint them as leaders over groups of 1,150. On learning experience based on Exodus 18, uh, 21, and I'll read that for you right now. Uh, moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, a place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. So basically what that's saying is um, make, the, make the man or woman that he has a fear of God most first and foremost um, and that is trustworthy and will not accept anything like money or jewels or things like that um, to govern your people and make them uh, the head of your uh, countries or towns or cities and things like that. So um, just uh, wanted to share a few points about um, uh, about voting and why it's important and very powerful. First of all, every citizen has the right to vote. If, as long as you are a US United States citizen, um, you can vote, okay? And does anybody know what a citizen is? It's quiet. Nobody knows what a citizen is? I know what a citizen is. Okay. I do. What, what's a citizen? Uh, a citizen is like someone that lives in the world, somewhere around the world. Yes, that's partly correct, yes. Evelyn, do you know what a citizen is? Yes, someone who lives in that state or country. Okay, right. So... Um, what you and Evelyn said is both correct. Good answer. So yeah. So you guys have the right to vote. Okay. That means that you can go and say who you want to be a leader. Some people don't have that right. Some people have that right taken away from them. And black churches, including um, the AME Zion Church, has helped uh, protect that right, okay? Um, because the right to vote gives people the power to have their voice heard, all right? And um, our faith is packed with hope and can only be seen by the world through our actions, right? And as you guys noticed here recently, um, certain actions have prompted um, a little bit of outrage from the black community, but it's all because we want, we our voices were not heard by the people we placed above us, and so you know protesting and things like that have have started um, so that we finally get our voices. So a little bit more about the African American churches help in getting people the right to vote. So we have AME Zion Church of Newburgh, which is an old church. We have Butter, Butler Chapel AME Zion Church. African American churches help civil rights leaders and volunteers uh, in the fight for voting rights. And you know that Lomax has hosted the NWA. We've also had other um, events that we participated in. And how many people know what person, visited, what famous person visited Lomax in the United Church in 1963? I do. Who is it? Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. So Martin Luther King Jr. came to our church 
1963. That was the year I was born. Uh, that was way before any of you guys were born. And he, uh, I think he spoke on the parking lot in the back of the church with the people before he went down to the market. Rock the vote. Let's rock the vote. Rock the vote. Let's rock the vote. Okay, I love you guys. Here, love you all. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 I love you all. Bye bye. Bye bye. Just call someone. Can we leave? Yep, you can go. Thank you so much. <laughs> and then get. Good morning, Lomax children. We are excited to celebrate Children's Day today in the AME Zion Church, and I hope that all of you are doing well. The theme for this year's Children's Day is lifting every voice. My voice matters. You may have seen pictures on the news or have talked to your parents about all the people who are marching and protesting around the world. This movement is called the Black Lives Movement. Because God wants all people to be treated the same, no matter what color they are. And guess what? Even though you are young, you can still have a voice because your voice matters too. In the book of Proverbs, in the Message Bible, chapter 31, verses 8 through 9, it says, Speak up for the people who have no voice. For the rights of all the down and outers, speak out for justice. Well, what does speaking out for justice mean? It means that God wants all of us, even you children, to speak up when you see something wrong and speak out when you see someone being treated unfairly. Have you ever been treated unfairly? I'm sure you have. Maybe everyone at school got a treat, except you. Maybe you were left out of a game or a party invitation to a friend. Have you had friends who were mistreated differently as well? Maybe because they were tall or short or fat or skinny, or maybe even because they were black or white or Asian or Latino. How did that make you feel? Maybe you were sad, and maybe you were even mad, and maybe you wished you could have done something about it. Black people today are being treated differently, and we are all trying to do something about it. Adults are getting ready to vote soon so that we can elect a president who will treat everyone fairly. You are too young to vote, but you can still do something because your voice matters. Young people like you have helped black people get the right to vote. They marched and protested right alongside the adults. They used their voice to chant and pray and even sing songs of freedom. You could do that too, or you can find your own thing. Maybe you could make a poster or give out snacks and water to the people who are marching and protesting and trying to vote. Maybe you could collect money and donate it to someone in need. Or maybe you can even make a video about Jesus and why he says that treating people differently is wrong. There are a lot of things that you could do to speak up for people who are being treated unfairly and make sure that the people who are in charge of this country will treat everyone the same, no matter what color they are. Think about it, pray about it, and then talk to your moms and dads, talk to family members, 
Talk to adults that you know and trust. Talk to Pastor Nelson or one of the other ministers at Lomax about your ideas because you can help too. God gave you three things that I want you to remember. God gave you hands. Hold out your hand. God gave you hands to help. God gave you a heart to love. And God gave you a voice to speak out. So do you remember those three things? God gave you hands to help, a heart to love, and a voice to speak out. God said we should do what is right. And that is what justice is all about. And God wants you to speak out when you see something wrong. Even you children, no matter how young you may be, God wants you to use the power that God gave you to speak out for someone who is in need. So I made myself a megaphone and I want you to make yourself a megaphone too. And I want you to say these words with me so that you remember that your voice matters. Okay, I got my megaphone. Here we go. My voice matters. My voice matters. My voice matters. My voice matters. Very good. And remember, children, that your voice does matter. Amen. We hope that you were blessed both by the meditation that was brought to us by Reverend Tina, as well as to see our children engaged in their Children's Day activities. If you would turn with me now for the morning message, we will be in the book of Psalms. We'll be in Psalm 137. And I'll be reading the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem's fall, how they said, tear it down, tear it down, down to its foundations. O daughter Babylon, you devastator, happy shall they be who pay you back what you have done to us. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. Let us pray. God, we thank you so much for this worship opportunity. We pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would visit us, that your Holy Spirit would speak, that your Holy Spirit would move and have its way, and that, God, we would be the better for it. And so, God, on this Children's Day, we also ask a special blessing upon our children. And we pray, God, that everything that they received also will help them in the years to come and in our world to come. We pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable unto thee. For, Lord, you are my strength and my redeemer. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Over the past two weeks... Our nation and our world has been grappling with racial injustice issues in particular and racism in general. There have been protests in every state in America, even in rural and suburban areas that don't have a significant black population. We've watched as Confederate statutes have been toppled to the ground. We've watched as corporate America has begun the conversation about how to dismantle systemic racism. We've watched as governments, local, state, and federal, have begun to put policies in place to bring about racial equity in this country. We've watched the NFL acknowledge its misunderstanding of 
the racial discrimination issues raised by its players. And even NASCAR has established a policy that the Confederate flag cannot be displayed at NASCAR events. And we watched George Floyd's homegoing service. We watched this final service. We watched his family prepare to lay him to rest. This week, Oprah Winfrey, through her own network, sponsored a two-night conversation with Black thought leaders that was broadcast across all the networks associated with Discovery Communications. The conversation centered around this question, where do we go from here? Oprah borrowed this question from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s 1967 book entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? Dr. King's book was his analysis of the state of American race relations in the 1960s, and he focused on what black people should do with their new legislative protections found in laws like the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Dr. King concluded that all Americans have to come together in order to fight for equality and eradicate poverty for all people. And so to borrow from Dr. King and from Oprah most recently, today God is asking us the same question, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Our text today is one that is probably familiar to many of us, Psalm 137. Scholars are very confident that Psalm 137 was composed by a Jewish psalmist while he or she was either living in exile in Babylon or shortly after they returned from exile back to Judah and Jerusalem. As one commentary noted, Psalm 137 was written when the pain of exile was still fresh in the minds and the hearts of the people. Beloved, our pain is fresh. The killing of George Floyd at the hands of Minnesota police officers has reopened wounds that have not healed from the last unjustified killing of a black person. Remember shortly before George Floyd's killing, we watched Ahmaud Arbery hunted down on a Georgia neighborhood street we saw a young black man who was out for a job be pursued, pinned in by two vehicles, shot to death like he was an animal in a safari killing. The pain is fresh. We have since learned that the person who claims he innocently took the video, that he allegedly hit Ahmaud Arbery with his vehicle as he was being pinned in. And we have since learned that the shooter called Ahmaud Arbery the N-word after he was killed. The pain is fresh. Ahmaud Arbery was treated like an animal and so was George Floyd. As was noted in the OWN Network special, the knee on the neck of George Floyd was reminiscent of the pose that hunters use when they kill animals. When they pose for a trophy picture, a picture that for people with a conscience required us to watch a man's life ebb out of him and leave his body physically. The pain is still fresh. We could call the role of those who died over the years from Emmett Till to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to Malcolm X, Ralph Abernathy, to Trayvon Martin, to Tamir Rice, to Sandra Bland, to Eric Garner, to Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, to George Floyd, to countless unnamed black men, women, boys, and girls who have died. The pain is fresh. And so Psalm 137 is a psalm that can speak to fresh pain, pain that we are still experiencing. Truth be told, Psalm 137 begs the question, where do we go from here? Before we delve into the psalm, I must point out that we have to be careful to not to put ourselves 100% in the shoes of the Jewish people whose Babylonian exile experience resulted in Psalm 137. We can learn lessons from the Jewish people, but we must recognize that our experiences as black people in America 
do not line up 100% with the experience of Jewish people who experience exile in Babylon. We know that the Jewish people experienced 70 years of exile in Babylon because of their disobedience to God. As a nation and as a people, they had worshipped both the God of Israel as well as false gods simultaneously. And so the Jewish people found themselves experiencing a deportation away from Jerusalem to Babylon that scholars argue happened in three phases. For our purposes, those three phases are not important. But what is important is that Judah, except for the remnant that was left behind, found itself living in a strange land. It was nothing like Jerusalem, one scholar notes. It was geographically strange with its systems of canals between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. Thus, when Psalm 137 begins with the words, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. Those exiled Jews were sitting by the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, remembering Zion, remembering Jerusalem, remembering the place where they believed that God could be found. I'm not aware of any biblical or historical basis to argue that the experience of black people in America is the result of God punishing us for being disobedient to God and engaging in idol worship in our motherland of Africa. That is not what I hear God saying to us this morning. However, as black people in America, we know that America has been our home, a place that we were brought to when our forefathers and foremothers were stolen from the continent of Africa. We too were deported to a strange land that is very different than our motherland. But even if we don't want to accept the common experience that we share as black people with Jews who were deported to Babylon, we should all be able to agree that as Christians, we know that this world is not our home. No, we are just travelers passing through. It would seem that we intended to, were intended to live in the Garden of Eden with God until our foreparents, Adam and Eve, were disobedient, having listened to the voice of the serpent over the voice of God, which resulted in us being deported out of the garden to live in our current exile existence in this world. Scholar Rainer Alberts estimates that about 70% of the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, tackles the question of how the catastrophe of the Babylonian exile happened and what Israel could learn from it. Though Israel's, his, though Israel's history does not 100% line up with our experiences as black people in America or as Christians seeking to live in the kingdom of God, there are lessons that we can learn from Israel's Babylonian experience as we grapple with the question, where do we go from here? To grapple with where do we go from here, what God has shown me in Psalm 137 is that there is a process that we must go through. If we're going to go from where we are as individuals, as black people, as a nation, and as Christians, in order to get where God would have us to be individually, as black people, as a nation, and as Christians. The first step in the process is that we must tap into our regret. That's my first point. Regret is identified as a synonym for grief. We grieve because we regret that something painful has happened to us. The psalmist here writes out of his own or her own fresh pain of living a life of exile in Babylon. He or she regrets their painful experience in Babylon saying, by the rivers of Babylon there we sat and there we wept when we remembered Zion. Like this psalmist, my sisters and brothers, we are weeping, we are grieving out of a sense of regret for what we have had to experience both historically and contemporaneously and so we sit by the rivers of the Potomac, the rivers of the Hudson, the Mississippi, the Missouri, the Rio Grande, and we weep. We weep as we regret that as black people, we were created in God's image, 
but are seen as having no divinity or humanity within us. We weep as we regret all of our ancestors who were stolen from Africa and who died in the transatlantic slave trade. We weep as we regret our ancestors who were stolen from Africa and who made it to America to be subjected to the worst form of chattel slavery that any people have ever experienced. We weep as we remember all of our ancestors who were legally freed, but who were systematically held in chains even up unto today. We weep as we regret that we are part of God's plan, God's people, and God's purpose, but the systems in place won't allow us to breathe and won't take its knee off our collective neck. Where do we go from here? First, we must tap into our regret, which represents our grief. The psalmist's regret can be heard in verses 2 and 3 where they say, On the willows there we hung our hearts, for there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. It is believed that Psalm 137 was written by a psalmist who had a role in worship. Maybe they played an instrument, which is why they mentioned hanging their heart. The same thing is true when it comes to the regrets that we are experiencing as black people in America about the injustice we are experiencing. Psalmist hangs their heart on the willow as a form of resistance, a, a form of protest. But what seems more likely is that the psalmist cannot play their harp and cannot sing the Lord's song in exile because in their view, doing so was not permitted. In verse 4, the psalmist asks the question, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Scholars say that the Lord's song could only be sung in Zion, in Jerusalem. These Lord's songs, which are understood to be joyful songs, could not be sung in exile in Babylon, but rather they could only be sung in the temple in Jerusalem. So what we may be seeing here is the psalmist regret about not being able to sing the Lord's song, to sing the Lord's praises in a foreign land. In other words, what we may be seeing here is the psalmist regret about not being able to praise God. My brothers and sisters, I want to remind you that this is one thing that we don't have in common with the Jewish people and the psalmist who wrote Psalm 137. While we may be in the midst of grief about what we've experienced and what we are experiencing right now as we fight for racial justice, as we tap into our regret, we need not regret losing our praise. The Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir sings a song entitled, I Never Lost My Praise. No matter what regret we have about the way that we have been treated as black people in America, no matter what regret we have about injustices in America, we can say that God has always been with us and God will always be with us as long as we remain faithful and steadfast to God. The lyrics of I Never Lost My Praise say, I never lost my hope. I never lost my joy. I never lost my faith. But most of all, I never lost my praise. And so we can have all the regrets about our current situation, but there is no reason for us to lose our hope, to lose our joy, to lose our faith, or to lose our praise. Church, we have no limitations on when we can praise. We have no limitations on where we can praise. We have no limitations on how we can praise. And so as we grapple with the question, where do we go from here? The first place to which we need to go is a place of tapping into our own regret, our own grief for what we have experienced as black people. But in doing so, God would caution us not to lose our praise. In addition to tapping into our regret, second, we must tap into our remembrances. We find these words in verses 5 and 6 of Psalm 137. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I don't set Jerusalem above my highest joy. 
One of the things that is an antidote for grief, for regret, is to remember. When we experience loss, especially the loss of a loved one, one of the ways that we cope with our grief, the one of the ways that we cope with our regret of losing our loved one is to remember our good experiences that we had with that person. Those memories, in many instances, get us through our tough times, our seasons of grief, our despair, and our regret. We need to remember the good experiences that we've had with God. That's exactly what the psalmist is doing here. In verse 5, the psalmist says, If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. The psalmist is recognizing the importance of having remembrances of who God is. The psalmist is saying that even as I sit here in this place of exile, I pray that I will never forget who God is and what God has meant to me. I can picture this psalmist remembering playing their heart for worship. Metaphorically, the psalmist also may be saying that every good and perfect gift comes from God, which is often depicted as coming from God's right hand and then deposited into the right hand of men, women, boys, and girls. And so the psalmist is saying that if I fail to remember who God is and what God has done for me, may my right hand, in which I've received blessings, blessings too numerous to recount, may, my, may I then die if I forget what God has meant to me. Likewise, the psalmist is saying that if I fail to remember this God that I love and I serve, may the tongue of, in my mouth stick to the roof in my mouth. If I fail to remember who God is and what God means to me. We would say, may I never clap my hands again if I fail to remember what God has meant to me over my lifetime. May I never shake a tambourine again if I fail to remember who God is in my life. May I never sing another note or another solo, another worship song, another praise song, another anthem, another spiritual, if I fail to remember how good God has been to me and to black people and to this nation. Church, we have some remembering to do. Remembering black people who survived the trip across the Atlantic. Remembering black people who overcame the adversities of slavery, remembering black people who per persevered even when the gains of reconstruction were taken back from them, remembering black people who, took, who looked racism in the face and said, we shall not be moved, we shall not be moved, remembering black people who said, I'm fired up and ready to go. And as a result, we had Barack Hussein Obama, I'm grappling with and grappling with answering the question, where do we go from here? We must tap into our remembrances, which will give us the strength to go on and see what the end will be with God. And so we must tap into our remembrances. We must tap into our regret. And the third thing we must do as we grapple with the, answering the question of where do we go from here? is we must tap into our resistance. One commentary noted that for the exiles, remembering Zion means faithfulness to God's place and God's ongoing purposes. It is an act of resistance in a foreign land. People are often troubled by the way that Psalm 137 ends. It seems to tap into what some would argue are some dark places of rage and revenge. But many believe that while Psalm 137 does speak to the rage of the Israelites and the revenge desired by the Israelites and the psalmist, Psalm 137 may be raw, but it's very real. Verses 7 through 9 of Psalm 137 read as follows. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem's fall, how they said, tear it down. Tear it down, down to its foundations. O oh, daughter Babylon, you devastator. Happy shall they be who pay back what has been done to us. 
Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against a rock. There are some very raw feelings being expressed here. These are people who were taken from their homeland, taken from the center of their religious life, taken in some instances, having seen loved ones and others experience death, and they're experiencing their own very raw and real rage. The rage of many of the protesters the last few weeks has been misunderstood. There's a video posted on Instagram circulating that expresses the rage that many black people are feeling right now. The Instagram post is of a woman, a young woman named Kimberly Jones, who says in a strong way that I can't even replicate the following. Economics were the reason that black people were brought to this country. If right now I wanted to play Monopoly with you, and for 400 rounds, I did not allow you to have any money. I did not allow you to have anything on the board. And then we played another 50 rounds of Monopoly. And everything that you gained and you earned was taken away from you. That was Tulsa. That was Rosewood. Those were places where we built black businesses and became independent and self-sustaining. And they burned them to the ground. And when we were playing Monopoly, we have to play on behalf of the person who's playing against us. You have to make money and then turn it over to the person for whom you are playing who is playing against you. Then when you do play, they burn your money, your cards, your property, but they tell you to catch up while psychological warfare is going on. She goes on to say, how can you win? The game is fixed. We are not burning down our communities because we don't own anything. We don't own anything. The social contract is broken. You broke the contract when you kill us in the streets. You broke the contract when you burn down what we did own. You broke the contract. They're lucky that what black people are looking for is equality and not revenge. And while Kimberly Jones's monopoly out analogy has some flaws in it, its reasoning, her points are well taken and she expresses the rage that many are feeling these days. It is the same rage that the psalmist expresses in verses 7 through 9 of our text as he recalls these enemies of the Israelites, the Edomites, who watched as Jerusalem and the temple fall at the hands of the Babylonians and how the Edomites yelled, tear it down, tear it down, down to the foundations. Though not expressed, there were probably men, women, boys and girls, even babies who died when Jerusalem fell. And so the psalmist says, oh God, can you remember what they did to us, to our city, to our place of worship, to our families, even our babies? The psalmist is expressing rage. The psalmist wants revenge. Well, rage is real and rage can be wrong. And what God allows us to do is express our rage and express how we feel, even if it's raw to God. That's what the psalmist was doing in Psalm 137. What God allows us to do is keep it 100 with God, to keep it real with God. And so as we try to figure out where to go from here, God is saying to us that that rage is OK, but revenge is not OK. Resistance is what lines up with the notions of God's justice. And so where do we go from here? We need to tap into a place of resistance. We resist racism that exists in us first. We resist racism that exists around us. We resist racism that is projected upon us. We resist racism in our schools, on the jobs, in sports and entertainment. We resist racism that is personal and systemic. We resist racism that is legal and institutional. We resist racism because racism is sin. Isaiah 49, 6, which was written for post-exile Israel, reminds Israel that it was to be a light to the nations that God's salvation may reach to the end of the earth. My brothers and sisters, as God's people, we too, even in the face of racism, 
are meant to be a light to the nations so that God's salvation may reach the ends of the world. That requires us to resist everything that is not like God, including the sin of racism. It may not be what we feel like doing. It may not be what we want to do, but it is what we are called to do as black people. It is what we are called to do as Christians. We are called to resist the sin of racism with every fiber in our being. We don't know where we're going to end up in this journey. But we do need to begin to ask the question, where do we go from here? And if we're going to get from here to where God is trying to take us, we've got to tap into that place of regret, that place of grief, where we acknowledge all that we are going through and all that we have gone through as a people. And then we can go from the place of regret and grief. We must tap into our remembrances to remember that we serve a God who's been with us all the while, a God who cannot fail, and a God who will win in the end, so that his kingdom can come to fruition. We need to remember who God is and who we are in God. And then we must tap into our resistance. We can't sit around and wait for God to do the work, but we've got to be the ones that do the work. Brother to brother, sister to sister, brother to sister, sister to brother, black to white, white to black, Black to brown, brown to black. We've got to be ones who resist sin in the form of racism. That is a daily endeavor. That is a lifetime endeavor. But we are called to be a light in the nation so that God's salvation and God's glory can come to pass in this world. Where do we go from here? Well, our theme for this year is let's go. Where do we go? Let's go. Where do we go? Let's go out. Where do we go? Let's go wherever we have to go to try to let somebody know that God is love, that Jesus died for us, that sin has been defeated, that racism should no longer exist because it's contrary to the will of God. Where do we go? We go towards God, the love of God, the justice of God. The mercy of God. The mission of God. Where do we go? We go and follow the example of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. We are tired. In fact, someone said, I'm tired of being tired. We're tired of this fight. We're tired of this burden. We're tired of this racism. We're tired of all of it, God. But God, we thank you that by your Holy Spirit, we can be empowered to do the work of kingdom building and bringing about a just world. And so God, I pray that each one of us would receive your message, God, that if we've got some regret and some grieving to deal with, let's, let's deal with it. It's okay to stay in a moment of grief but then we have to move to a place of remembrance to remember that we don't grieve as others grieve, but we would grieve as those who have hope. That's joys that have joy as those who have a praise because we remember who you are and how great you are in this world and in us. And then God, we pray that you would breathe on us so that we might find our inner resistance to stand up in every situation and in every way. God, we pray that we would receive these marching orders and that we would go so that your world may come to pass. God, we can't go in our own strength, but we have to go in relationship with you. And so if there's anyone under the sound of my voice who does not know you, is not in relationship with you, and you feel a burning to go out and make the world better, I would suggest to you that you need to go with God. And that means that you need to acknowledge that we were born into sin because of Adam and Eve and that Christ came so that we might be redeemed, that he died so that we might live again, that he got up so that we might have hope and eternal life. And if you cannot say that you've made that profession of faith, you can do so right where you are. And then you can reach out to us so that we can pray with you and connect you with our church or the church of your choosing. If you're looking for a church home and you want to be a justice fighter, 
at Lomax. We invite you to contact us so that we might help you begin this journey with us. God, thank you for this hopeful message that there is somewhere for us to go from what we've been experiencing. And you're waiting for us to get up and do what you called us to do. God, we thank you for the reminder on this day of our children. Our children represent hope. And we thank you, God, for the hope that we can experience for a bright future for our children. We pray, God, that they won't have to live in a world where there is the sin of racism. We pray, God, that they can have the hopes and aspirations of their hearts. And that, God, they will live in a world where they no longer are seen as those who don't have the divinity and the humanity of God within them. So God, we pray a special blessing over our children. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. I pray that you would say right where you are, amen, amen, and amen.
I will surely fall. Jesus, I need your strength. Hold me. I need your mercy. Jesus, if you hold me, hold me. Everything will be alright. Jesus, somebody need you, hold Lord. Me. Be a doctor. Jesus, somebody need you, hold Lord. Me. Be a lawyer. Jesus, somebody lying hold me. on the bed of affliction. Jesus, they have pain. Hold me. They have so much Jesus. pain. So much hold pain. Me. Jesus, listen to hold me, hold me, right now, Lord. Jesus, Lord, I need hold you, me. right now, Lord. Jesus, you are not the hold me. Yes, you are, Jesus. Jesus, somebody say you are lawyer. Hold me. Yes, you are, Jesus. Jesus, somebody say you pray. Hold me. Pray when I'm home. Jesus, somebody say you want to hold me. You want to win a person. Jesus, somebody say you are rock. Hold me. Somebody say you are rock. Jesus, somebody say you're a rock. Hold me. A rock in a weary land. Jesus. Others say you're a shelter. Hold me. In the time of the storm. Jesus. I want to take a little time out. Hold me. And ask you one question right now. Jesus. Do you need the Lord? Hold me. Do you need the Lord? Jesus. Do you need him to hold? Hold me. Hold you in the morning. Jesus. Hold you in the evening. Hold me. Hold you later, 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 the meaning from your heart, church. Hold me. Won't he answer prayer? Jesus. Won't he answer prayer? Hold me. And I get one win. Jesus. But God will answer prayer. Hold me. Still away by yourself somewhere. Jesus. And ask him to hold me. Hold me. Hold me. Hold me. Jesus. Hold me. 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 Hold me.